Well, uh, good evening, everyone. It's um, remarkable. We have been through 14 chapters, uh, well, 13 chapters, and we're on the 14th chapter of the book of Hosea. Um, it, it, one of the things, uh, one of the things that I think makes this book helpful, particularly in the times that we're in now, is that as you've been reading through Hosea, have you got this impression? It's, it's, very, it's, it's very choppy water. It's like, it's very choppy water. It, it, it's, it's not, things are, things, one minute we're getting a, a message of judgment, the next minute we're getting a, judge, a message of hope, and it's hope, judgment, hope, judgment, hope, judgment, hope, judgment, all the time. It's very choppy. And yet, as we're going to discover this evening, um, this, although it appears as you look through the through the through the book through the book, as if we're going through kind of almost sometimes very abrupt turns and changes, what you're going to see tonight is that um, is that the the last chapter of Hosea brings us back to the first chapter, and demonstrates that that God is sovereign. Uh, in the chaos God's sovereign in the chaos and and that surely has got to be uh, something for us uh, to hold on to something for us to hold on to in a time that well I don't think since the 1960s and the Cuban Missile Crisis have we been in such a uh, dramatic uh, a dramatic situation a situation where we uh, where where it is difficult to see uh, a wonderful outcome for this war. And yet, as we have been reading Hosea, it, 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 we can say the same thing, can't we? We can say, as we look at Hosea, it's difficult to see uh, a, a great outcome for Israel, given that their, their sordid kind of fickle nature. It's difficult to see this wonderful outcome and yet this splendid faithful God has promised a wonderful outcome. And that's what we're going to look at this evening. Um, so let me read you. Uh, let me read you chapter 14. Uh, and even before I start, I want to say to you, um, Hosea is about the most awkward Hebrew, I think, in the Old Testament. Um, so if you've got a translation that reads something different from what I say, that is predominantly the, going to be the reason. It's not just the usual thing of some, some people have literal translations, some dynamic, some, uh, some more uh, looser translations looking for meaning like the message. It's not that in this case. In this case, it's genuinely difficult to interpret some of the Hebrew. And that's a lot of the commentators are full of all that information. And what that means is we've learned as we've gone through these 14 chapters to be a bit relaxed when there are differences in our translation. So just bear that in mind, because I'm going to be correcting the NIV a little bit um, as I go as well. So chapter 14, verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously, and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria can't save us. We'll not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade. He will flourish like the corn. He will blossom like a vine, and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and take care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? He'll realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. 
So that's our text for this evening. Um, some people, if you if you'd like to sort of break a chunk of text into lumps, uh, then uh, here's uh, here are the three lumps that I see. Uh, what I've called the first section, I've called it. Will you return my call? Will you please return my call? You know, we've we have seen um, we have seen, haven't we? God faithfully calling His people and His people faithfully going the opposite direction. <laughs> and 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 we, I will have always been, you know, saying that's that is the inclination of man's heart. The heart is deceitful above all things, and who can who can cure it? So the first section, you you is God saying, you will return, you'll return my call. You will. One day you'll return. And he keeps leaving messages on their phone. It must be like if, if Hosea is coming home, or the people of Israel rather are coming home, and they're seeing 125 messages on the machine in the little, or the, the blink. It used to be we used to have a number, didn't we? Was like one, two, three. And it, if it got over 10, I think that was it. Could it just we lost? That's the, that's the thing that's been going on. God has been faithfully calling out to his people, but his people haven't returned his call until chapter 14. So uh, will you return my call? I, then the second section, four to eight, I want to sing you a love song. Will you return my call? I want to sing you a love song. And then, uh, then finally, uh, it turns out that uh, the love song and the, the marriage uh, will lead to uh, us sending out a message to the whole of mankind. So will you return my call? I want to sing you a love song. And then we're going to send this message out across the world as a warning and an encouragement. So those, that's, that's really, and it's one of the reasons why Jose makes such a good opening to the book, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, the, to the latter prophets, because it, it sets up a big, it's got a big theology, possibly a bigger, broader theology than some of the other books. So let's have a look at the text. Uh, the first thing, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have been your downfall. Well, the first thing I want to do is, is change that to return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your guilt. You've stumbled in your guilt. And the reason I want to, to, to use that word stumbled is you'll see, I don't know if you, normally in a group you can say, um, if you look to the third last word in chapter 14, you'll see that strangely it's stuck. That's right, Tim, it's stumbled. So there's, there's stumbling is, 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 a, is, a, is a bookend. So, and the word return has in it the idea, uh, it's, it's used four times in this, just this little opening section. And the return, it, the return is you, you, you return to somewhere you've come from. One of the wonderful things of having a biblical worldview, of being a, a believer in Jesus and seeing the world through God's eyes is that we know where we're coming, where we've come from, and we know where we will return to. And that's the idea. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. This phrase, uh, to the Lord your God, is um, uh, very significant in the sense that it is used in a number of other places in Hosea. And each time it's pointing back to the great redemption in the book of Exodus and to the, 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 the Ten Commandments that the people were given. And if you remember in Deuteronomy, the reason that the people of Israel were given the commandments and the laws and the precepts was that, so that they might live lives that reflected God's glory and that the nations that surrounded them would see that and be drawn to it. So God's desire for the people to return to him is so that others might know him and so that his people would actually live lives worthy of the calling that they've received because it was God's intention that uh, that the people of Israel would be the the first witnesses to the truth of the gospel 
And then he calls them back and he says, uh, return, to, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your, you have stumbled in your guilt. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our guilt and accept that which is good, and we shall offer our lips as bulls. That's our next little section. When I first read this, I just thought it was incredible that we've got this, this word repent, return, which is the same word repent. Repent and take words with you. Repent and take words with you. It sounds so much like the book of Romans. You remember in, in Romans, I think it's uh, in Romans 10. Uh, no, 9, it's 9.32, isn't it? If you forgive me. No, no, 10 is right. I'm arguing with myself here. It's 10, I was right the first time. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The Hebrews teaches us that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away the sin of, God, of God's people. They were merely ceremonial things. And here we see this very clearly in Hosea. If you want to restore the relationship, he says, come back to me with words, words that reflect an inner change in you. It is uh, when when we do kind of uh, evangelistic missions, um, this is precisely the kind of conversations that, that lead to something that's often called a sinner's prayer, which, although it doesn't appear in the Bible, is a simple kind of way of thinking about uh, admitting your guilt and asking for forgiveness. And look how we can how we will be received by God. Uh, when we go to him and say, forgive all our sins, receive us graciously. He'll receive us graciously. It's clear as we look at it that the only hope for the Israel that we have been looking at in each of the chapters of this book, the only hope for them is, is to come to God, confess their sins, knowing that they will be graciously forgiven. And he says, uh, then there's this interesting phrase, that we may offer the fruit of our lips, or that we'll offer our lips as bulls. Um, it seems a rather strange phrase, doesn't it? Our lips as bulls. <laughs> it just doesn't, which is, I guess, why the NIV has plumped for um, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Um, let me deal with the bulls first. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of a letter, uh, which one it is, and uh, so it could be bull, it could be, it could be, um, it could be bull, or it could be um, the fruit of our lips. Um, if it's bull, then then the easiest in your translation, then the best way to think of it, that the bull was this big was a big sacrifice, uh, often a sacrifice, I think, for for the nations tradition according to the rabbis um, that the bull was a sacrifice for the a part of the bigger sacrifice for the whole world so maybe that's one way of looking at it but it's this offer the fruit of our lips uh, that i find to be uh, more in keeping with the way that uh, that, it, that, that the scripture flows to me so taking words with us you remember in isaiah come let us uh, come let us reason together though your sins are like scarlet i will wash them white as snow and and he he accuses them isaiah accuses the people of worshiping with their lips but their hearts being far from him well what we have here is the bringing together of life and lip i think is the christian way of talking about it that our their lives and their lips match up together uh, think of uh, psalm 51 with uh, david after he committed adultery with bathsheba uh, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praises. And others like, uh, let's think, uh, Psalm 24, who may ascend to the who may ascend 
In fact, Psalm 24 is worth a read. The earth is the Lord's and uh, everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol, will swear by what is false. He will receive blessing for the Lord and vindication from God his saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Um, and then interestingly, the, the rest of the psalm, uh, lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Well, we know it's Yeshua. It's, we know it's the Messiah. Uh, it, quite clearly displayed there. Lift up your heads, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord Almighty is the king of glory. So what um, what we are being taught here is that repentance brings blessing. We were taught that repentance is going to bring blessing. And the next little section, <clears throat> we're going to see that um, finally, finally, something has happened. There's been a transformation. Um, there has been a transformation in the people because they are going to say Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you, the fatherless find compassion. Something has happened. Uh, and the something that's happened is, is, this, is the judgment. We are looking at the, the judgment, the judgment that we've been that we saw in so much detail, uh, particularly in the last couple of chapters, has, has fallen on Israel. And finally, they have realized Assyria cannot save us, nor will we mount war horses, nor will we ever say our gods to what our own hands have made. Um, Assyria, it's Assyria really, I think, it, although it's a real country with a, in a real uh, political uh, economic uh, situation it although it is it, it, it represents this little section really represents uh, the the realization uh, that 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 i read to you from psalm uh, from psalm 24 that the earth is the lords and everything in it it's seeing it's, see, it's, it's like a wake up call. Have you ever had a wake up call where you suddenly realize that you've been looking at the looking at a situation completely wrong? And you and, and you it's like, wow, I, I, I got that completely wrong. I thought X, but really Y. And that's what's happened to Israel here. They've realized that Assyria can't save them, that they that they're that they're that the Lord. They, I mean, God has been telling them. <laughs> I'm your fortress, I am your fortified city, I am your hill, I am your shield, I am your spear, I am your defender, I am your mighty warrior, I am the Lord of hosts. He's been telling them and telling them, and he's been telling us and telling us. But we, like Israel, struggle to trust him. And, and we look to earthly, earthly power, uh, which is so clearly demonstrated by Assyria, and the idea of the war horse, because the, 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 the war horse was uh, like the 40 mile long tail, but the 40, mi 40 miles long line of Russian tanks sitting somewhere in the Ukraine, but you can't tell from the photograph. You know, it's, it's like a, when I was younger, um, it's like a chief, it's the chieftain tank. Uh, if you played top trumps when you were a kid, uh, the chieftain tank was a great one to get because it had tremendous firepower. So a war horse is, is the ultimate kind of firepower. It's, sometimes it's a war horse connected with chariots. But it's that idea there. And then and that's that's been that's been one of Hosea's themes is he's been saying, why are you why are you seeking to find security in in the in the physical world? And why and, and not listening to what I say to you. And that is that is precisely our situation. That's still still he's begging us. He's begging me. 
to, to take him at his word. And he's, he's waiting for the day when I say, the Syria can't save me. And I, I, I won't mount a war horse again. So that's that. So that's that. And then we will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. This is obviously the other big theme, not just in Hosea, but a, but particularly uh, the 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 Torah, the five books of Moses, is this this propensity towards idolatry. This is propensity and and idolatry. It's genuinely, um, it's most frequently something good turned into some turned into a, a good thing. They say this phrase, a good thing turned into a God thing. A good thing turned into a God thing. So very often, idolatry is is something that we've taken that's taken the place of. Uh, taking the place of God in our hearts. It's not this idea of sin, of the falling short of the, for example, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not falling short of God's standard of perfection. It's putting something else in his place. And I was really struck, for some reason, I don't know why I was struck by this particularly, but We'll no longer work, say to our gods, uh, we'll no longer say to what our hands have made, you are our gods. Um, I think this is a reference back to the golden calf, uh, where you remember Moses. I mean, it's not unreal, unreasonable. Moses goes up to the top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights where he has no food or water. So. I can tell you that if you go 40 days and 40 nights with, without food and water, you'll die. You can't live for, you know, aside of a miracle, the most natural conclusion um, is, that, uh, is that Moses isn't coming back. And that's part of the, part of the whole story is we're, we're to see that, that God sustained Moses on the mountain just as he sustained uh, uh, Jesus in the wilderness in the Gospels. So what happened at uh, with the golden calf, which is the, the highest picture of the idolatrous behavior of Israel, was that they worshipped something that their hands have made. Now, what there's another thing to think about here, and that is that by worshipping something you have made, the creator is worshipping the created. The, the creator is worshipping the created thing. So, so it's, it should be that the creature, us, that we, worship the creator. But idolatry flips that on its head. And when things are, it's inverse and perverse, and that isn't the way that we were designed to live. We were not designed to live as the creator. We were designed to live as the creature dependent on the loving God that we've heard, heard so much about in the uh, positive sections of this book. So idolatry reverses the natural order. It puts something in God's place that, that, that shouldn't be um, and that it, and it causes us pain. And he is a loving father who doesn't want us to experience pain and as that runs into the next thing, he says, for in the fatherless, for in you, the fatherless find compassion. You, um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, I'll try and restrict my Ukraine examples uh, of things, but I don't know if you saw the, uh, the, 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 the train station with the, um, with the, the father on the mobile phone, he put his hand on the window of the train carriage. And he was talking to his son on the other side. And obviously, he somehow he got onto the platform, but they wouldn't let him onto the train. And now he's got to say goodbye to his son. And you see him talking like this. And then he takes his, he, he, the train leaves and you still see the hand of the boy. 
disappearing off in the train. That boy is, is fatherless. And the sense here is, 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 is the sense of when those two are reunited, it's that love, that overwhelming love that fatherless people can find in the Lord Jesus, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a God, uh, 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 2 Corinthians teaches us that he's, uh, he's the God of compassion and that he's called us to live lives of compassion towards ourselves and towards others as we reflect his image. I think verse four is probably the center of uh, the center of the matter uh, of this really maybe even you could say uh, um, you could say that it's the center of Hosea's message because it's it's a promise uh, three things are promised healing love and the turning away of his anger he says first i will heal their waywardness um <clears throat> The Lord looks at Israel's sin as a sickness, uh, like a broken leg or a, um, a broken leg or a depression or uh, gallstones or weak valves in your heart or short sightedness. Um, it's something that he's going to heal. The only hope for humanity is that God will heal our waywardness. In Isaiah, all, uh, Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it is by his stripes, by his wounds, that we are healed. But we don't have to go to as far as Isaiah. Uh, we could go back to chapter six here. And where we read at the beginning of chapter six, come, let us return to the Lord. See the same, the same idea. The thing, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He's injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. So, so now we're seeing in verse four, the fulfillment of the promise in chapter 6, verse 1. And how does God love his repentant children? Freely. Freely. The words of repentance that come from the heart of the believer are sufficient for his love to burst its banks. And then his, and then his anger has turned away from them. And it's at this point that we see how God can be both forgiving and just. Um, He's faithful and just. If you remember in 1 John, he's faithful and just. And will if and will forgive our sins if we confess them to him. 1 John 1 9. This is this is why we need uh, this is why we need this Nazarene hanging on a cross and dying for our sins. Because if he's going to heal our waywardness and love us freely, he has to do that and remain just. He has to remain just. There has to be uh, some way for the anger that should rightly fall on us to be turned away from us. There is no way, I don't suppose, that Hosea, maybe, I don't know, I mean, I, it's difficult to know what, it's sure, I'm sure that Hosea wrote more than he knew. But how much he knew, 
I don't know. But you see there this, this idea that God's going to save us. That's why he, he uses this uh, phrase, uh, return to the Lord your God. It's the redemption kind of title. He's going to free us, uh, free us and redeem us and rescue us and heal us and do it freely and in love because his anger has been turned away and it has all been laid on, on Jesus on the cross. That's why in the email, I think I said, I, I just, I'm just really struck by how you've got repent, believe, repent, repent, confess that Jesus is Lord and you'll be forgiven. It's, it's, it's written right into the end of Hosea. And it kind of connects, in my mind, it connects up to the idea that the, that the gospel, according to Romans 1, in, in the gospel, a righteousness, righteousness has been revealed that is from God uh, and that is by faith and first to last to the Jewish person first and then to all the nations. So it's not, it's not that it's not that Paul invented that idea or created it. It's just he found a really snappy way of expressing it that's found itself into the heart of the one of the key books of the old testament uh, of the new testament now <clears throat> here comes the bit i uh, i'm most looking forward to and most uh, nervous about uh, because uh, you need to get your finger out if you've got a bible and put your finger in this the book that's called the song of songs so uh, the song of songs is uh, well, it's a bit risky for uh, a Tuesday night uh, in Christian circles. Uh, but for some reason, God, uh, God has got it. It's, it's the book that follows Ecclesiastes. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a book that follows Ecclesiastes. And we'll come back in a way to Ecclesiastes uh, because you'll see um, the end of Ecclesiastes is very much like the end of the book of Hosea. But if you, I've given you enough time, I hope, to find the Song of Songs, because remember, I said that the first part of the the, um, the first part of this is about will you return my call, Israel? Will you return my call? And then I said I'm going to sing you a love song. So I will be like the Jew to Israel. That's D E W, not J E W. I will be like the Jew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like that of an olive tree. His fragrance like the cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again, again in his shade. He'll flourish like the corn or the grain. He'll blossom like a vine and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. This is what I want to call God's love song. And let me show you why I think you can look at it as a love song. Let's... Um, uh, because the word blossom, first of all, has been used in uh, in chapter ten for um, for the spreading of weeds. Uh, it's in uh, ten verse four. Therefore, they make uh, they make many promises and false false oaths. They make false agreements. Laws lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in a ploughed field. So where the transformation that's taking place with the blossoming is where, where once life produced weeds, now it's going to produce something positive. And look, um, I will be like the Jew to Israel. Something also has been reversed there. Because in 13 verse 3, Israel's uh, faith was like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. The, 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 it's not a matter of our faith in him, but his grip on us. It's not a matter of our faith in him, but his grip on us. So he'll be like the Jew to Israel, a Jew, like the Jew that fell in the desert with the manna, and was provision and that and that fed all the people so he's going to provide for them 
he'll he will blossom like a lily uh the flower so it's flowers instead of weeds in its simplest term but if you look at um if you look at song of songs uh let's see if you look at in fact very beginning i think uh da, 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 da. where's it gone oh no that's later 611 I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley to see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates were in bloom. Uh, before I realised it, I set my, uh, my desire upon the royal chariots of my people. There's blossoming and blossoming just appears again and again. And this lily, oh, it's two chapter. It's the, the lily appears in chapter two, verse two. So chapter one says, I am the rose of Sharon, Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling amongst the maidens. Uh, and then slightly more, um, uh, slight, then you've got in chapter four, uh, the same picture. Uh, how, beautiful, how beautiful you are. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep. Uh, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. Uh, your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse amongst the lilies. And this is this is where Hosea is 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 leaning heavily on Hebrew poetry and Hebrew the the, the poetry and the phrases and the rhythms of the Book of Song of Songs. Uh, 7.13. Yeah, the, the mandrakes send out their fragrance. At our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I've stored up uh, for you, my lover. The, the picture here is if you read through the Song of Songs, you'll just see that, you know, my, his lips are like uh, chapter 5, verse... It, it, chapter 5 verse 13 his cheeks are like beds of spice yielding perfume his lips are like lilies again dripping with myrrh the the this this marriage that we're seeing at the end of the book of hosea is full of passion it's full of passion it's full of desire it's it's all the right it's the right emotions focused on the right object Whereas idolatry was the right emotions focused on the wrong object, now we've got the right emotions uh, focusing on the, the right object. And then he picks this other image, like a cedar of Lebanon, he'll send down his roots. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he'll send down his roots. Well, the cedars of Lebanon in the ancient Near East were symbols of power and uh, longevity. Um, they were famed, actually, for the firmness of their roots. And if you turned, we don't have time because I'm uh, running out of space uh, before Fiona sends me a message. Um, if you look at Jeremiah 17, uh, you'll see, um, you will see this, uh, this idea really clearly uh, described. Jeremiah 17, eight, uh, in fact, seven, let's say, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence in his, is in him. Verse eight, he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. That's what Hosea wants to, that's the kind of image that Hosea um, Jeremiah, in fact, borrowed off Hosea. It's the other way around. Because Hosea, I think, was before Jeremiah. But you can see the link. Whichever way you look at it, God wrote, the, God wrote it. So you can see that. Uh, he'll send down his roots and the shoots will grow. This is also a reversal of what happened in chapter 9. Uh, I wasn't here with you when we did chapter 9, I don't think. Uh, but in chapter 9, Ephraim is blighted. Their root is withered. They yield no fruit. Do you see how uh, what was wrong in chapter nine has now been put right 
in chapter 14. It's remarkable how the Holy Spirit has simultaneously quoting, uh, using the Song of Songs to wrap up the whole message of Hosea. And it's, it's this passionate marriage. And oh, wouldn't it be funny if it started off with the marriage? Oh, yeah, it did. It, it started off with the marriage, didn't it? So it's, it's, it's just so brilliant to see what to, to see what God is saying. He's look, he's saying to us, as he is always saying to us, as I'm always saying, it'll be all right on the night. You know, in the end, it will all pan out. Uh, things in the end, we will we we can take God at his word. He's been reliable. Christianity is is the only faith that you can truly have, you know, historic confidence that the that the impossible happened you know that's with christianity we can have historic confidence that the impossible happened that jesus did uh, rise from the dead and just in case you think this week somebody said to me about reminded me that light is both a particle and a wave well it's impossible for it simultaneously to be a particle and a wave it's got to be a wave or a particle but in fact it's both and that's exactly the same thing with the uh, with Christianity and the, re the resurrection. Um, I'll take five more minutes and then I will finish. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like the cedar of Lebanon. Uh, fragrance, just, just scoot through Song of Songs, fragrance is, is always, um, it's so many different things. It's, it's the charm of the man. It's the scent of the woman's love. It's, the, the, it's used in the context of a season of love. And do you remember back in chapter two, um, God promised that he would allure, uh, allure his people Israel. God promised that he would allure his people Israel. And I think whether, I can't remember whether I was teaching or Fiona was, but it has this sort of sense of um, seduce, seduction has this sense of seduction and so again what was promised this seduction that was promised in chapter two is revealed as happening in uh, chapter 14 and then israel will um, men will dwell again in his shade he'll flourish like the grain um flourish like you know the whole business with the ba baal worship was uh, he was the god of the harvest so if you worshipped him, if you sacrificed your uh, children in the fire, you would have a good harvest. And you remember again that earlier in the book, he said uh, he said he said that he was Yahweh says that he is the source of the grain. But Israel didn't know it, it says that in chapter two, verse nine. And what is left for us to look at? Ephraim, what more do I uh, have with idols? Uh, I will answer him and care for him. I am green pine tree, your faithfulness comes from me. Um, I suppose I just, I want to point you to Jesus, uh, and particularly I want to point you to John, what do I want to point you to? John chapter 15, where, where Jesus, it's one of his, I am, I am the true vine. You remember, he, he is, I am the bread, I'm the living bread, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I'm the gate, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection and the life. But I'm 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 also the true vine. He will blossom like a vine. And in in John's in John 15, we're told that as we as we as we uh, abide in Him, we will produce much fruit. And without abiding in Him, we will produce no fruit. And here, the blossoming like a vine takes place. And this fame, uh, the fame of the wine uh, from Lebanon, uh, it's not about the off licenses. Um, it's not about you know the the. The, the ability of Israel to produce wine, although I've been to vineyards in the Lebanon, it's not about that at all. Again, if you look in the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 4, 4, verse 10, 5, verse 1, 7, verse 9, or 8, verse 2, you'll see, uh, you'll see this image of fine wine being used. It's all part of this great wedding that we're being, this, that's being displayed for us. I am a green pine tree. I am a tree full of life. It's actually, I think, the only place where God is described as a tree. But here he's described as a tree and that our fruitfulness comes from being connected to his branches. That's where our fruitfulness comes. And then, then Hosea finishes 
where Ecclesiastes finishes with a saying, who is wise, he'll realize these things. Who is discerning, he will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right, the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. Um, this evening, as we conclude Hosea, he's giving us a choice. We can walk safely in the ways of the righteous, you remember Psalm, uh, Psalm one: "Blessed is the man who walks, who does not walk in the seat of uh, walk in the way of mockers." It, it, it's exactly the same thing you see in the beginning of the book of Psalms. More, which is, and Psalms are wisdom for life. Here we say, "Do you want to walk? Do you want to walk safely, or do you want to stumble tragically?" We, the world is wide. Wide, wide, wide uh, is the uh, gate to destruction. Narrow is the path to salvation. You know, we we want, we want, we want to build our lives on on the rock of God's promises, in order that we might be able to pull people up, to rescue people, to bring them in. That that more people would dwell in His shade, in the shade of the gospel, and be safe. The solution to our broken relationship with God is simple. We simply need to return to him, acknowledge our wrongdoing, and he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you see that you, that is the climax of the story of the book of Hosea. But in the meantime, what Hosea wants us to know is that God is sovereign, that he's working towards an end point, and that end point is him. The end point is him. It is the end point of, of, a, of a new creation, of a new Eden, of a new relationship, of us being the, you know, his, they says we will see each other, we'll see him as he is, and we'll see each other for the first time, truly, as his, his image-bearing co-regents. And it will just be beyond our imagination. And Hosea has used the Song of Songs to, to, to give us an, a flavour of the wonder of what this great day will be like. So uh, as, we, as, we, as we are buffeted by all the news and all the terrifying things, remember this great promise. Remember this great hope. It will warm your hearts and lift, you, lift your heads, just as, it, uh, uh, just as we saw in that psalm that I read from.